Hi everyone, welcome to Photography Chat with Merlin, uh, Season 2, Episode 39 with Zane Pollard. Uh, we'll get Zane on in here and then we can get going with the chat. Happy Wednesday. I hope uh, y'all are doing good. How's everyone's week going out there? Thanks for joining in. And there he is. Let's get him in. There he is. All right. How you doing, big guy? Doing good. How are you? Not too bad. Oh wait, just a sec. I will be. Give me one second. I'll be right back. Okay. For right. some reason, my speaker for a talk didn't act originally. Now we're on. Sweet. How you doing, man? Doing pretty good. How are you doing today? I was living the dream. You know, only one more day till Friday. Oh, yeah. I had a long day at work, so I'm like, I'm ready for the weekend just to re like relax. Same here. It's, it's been like back to back zooms every day all this week, and um, yeah, I'm kind of ready for no zooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been I've been having to clean up a lot of coworkers' mistakes, so it's been it's been a fun day. Oh wow! So when you're not tweaking on Polaroid cameras, what do you what do you do for the, your day job? Oh. Um, I kind of, at, at my job, I, I wear kind of like a lot of hats as far as that goes. Um, so what I do most of the time is I uh, write software that interfaces um, like basically like my company's sales file formats and the back office softwares because I work for a commercial fueling company. Okay. So it's all like, like truck stops and gas stations and stuff like that. So I got to take those files and turn it into whatever archaic system <laughs> somebody else uses. So That's a very vast difference from playing with Polaroids all the time. Oh yeah, no, it's like, it's like a night and day difference. It's completely different. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> I, I do. I also do like just general support at it. Like, because it's only like, there's only, in the office at any time, like five people. So, oh, okay. So it's kind of like, small. yeah, pretty much. So. Um, if you want to take just a, a sec um, to like, just give everyone a, an intro uh, about yourself. Uh, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm Zane. I, uh, I've been, shooting Polaroids for like, I don't even, at this point, I think I started heavily 2012, maybe. I was shooting mostly like peel apart film. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically I've just been shooting film and Polaroids for getting close to a decade now. Um, and yeah, so it, it's kind of, it's evolved from like, just like completely being a hobby to like, you know, uh, I guess kind of becoming like a hobby slash job with, you know, Polaroid repairs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty much all about me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not crazy interesting. What, uh, what got you into the Polaroids though? Uh, what got me into Polaroids was definitely, um, I don't know. I, I, I really liked the ability. So like whenever I was shooting pack films, especially, um, all I had was like, a, like I, I like the idea of being like being able to take quick pictures at like parties and stuff. So that's what I was mostly doing. Yeah. So I, I only had a, a model 420 land camera, like one of the, one of the, you know, plastic lens, uh, pack film cameras. So nothing like nothing crazy. 
um, but I didn't have a proper flash for it. So whenever I would take it to parties, I actually had like a, a separate flash that I would use the test button on. So I'd, I'd open the shutter and then I'd fire the flash and then close it. So I'd put it in bulb mode basically <laughs> just so I could fire the flash and get it, get it off. If you know, it was, it was dark enough and I, I've gotten like some, I got like really good shots off with it. Uh, like I, I learned, I learned the workflow with that pretty, pretty well. So I was taking like this, this <laughs> crazy looking like back film camera to, to parties and stuff. And, you know, people would be really confused while I was do why I was doing it, but it was, it was fun. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's wild. I, I'm, yeah. I imagine like that would be kind of a, kind of a neat look. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like it would, I, I think I'd have some. Well, I might not anymore. I might have like taken them off um, because I kind of like every once in a while, I, like it, I'll just like take pictures off <laughs> off of my Instagram for for no real reason. Like I'll just feel like it. I'll just take them off. But I used to have like pictures that I, I scanned in of of my shots that I would do on um on pack film. Um, and then once that like went away, I started shooting impossible film more. Um, and that was probably like 2013 maybe. And that was when I got my first SX 70, um, which sadly, uh, cause I think I, I needed to pay like rent one month. I think I sold it <laughs> at some point oh, because I, I don't have the, the one that I originally had anymore, which sucks. I mean, I wish I did, um, but you know that's that's kind of that's kind of how it happens sometimes. But now I've gotten back into it, and I own way too many SX seventies. <laughs> I I feel you there, man. Yeah. <laughs> I I think we have a mutual problem with that. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> like Jesus, I I've got a stack that I need to send you still. Oh yeah. Um, and like there's a couple parts ones in there there's yeah there's just some interesting i got like this sears one that it looks like they mix mishmash some parts together oh yeah on it so it's like black with some silver but oh no those, those were like original so like um it, is it like the chrome faceplate and then the uh the chrome top viewfinder piece yeah it's like yeah and then the yeah that, that's that's how so i i have like this one right here i i i don't remember what happened to like this like this is my open s670 camera I, don't, I think it's my parts bin because um, I took this one apart whenever I needed to like fix somebody else's camera and I needed the sonar module because it was completely banged up. Um, but yeah, this one this one was also a, a Sears model, so uh, it had like the. Well, no, no, I think it was either Sears or Kmart. It was, it was like one of the big box stores. Um, I have like all of the original like manuals and stuff that like dictate this model has like this you know, color pattern. Uh, but yeah, no, those, those are like original. Uh, they're, they're like probably sold in smaller quantities because they're a little bit rare to find. Kind of like the, the white alphas. That yeah. Was sold for so, a while. Here, just, I'll, I'll grab them here. Cause I've got, uh, where is it? Oh. It's got a really gross, um, skin on it right now um but it's that guy yeah and yeah it's the sears special yeah 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 it's the it's got the silver front but the rest of it is all black yeah there, there's also the versions that have the the top of the viewfinder that's chrome as well there's like there's like so many different versions of those cameras that they, they kind of mismatch like mix and match some of the, the colorings depending on the special edition. So I, think, really I think it works, um, but it'll end up in the next shipment down to you just to okay. get cleaned up. And then this was that white one I was talking about maybe trading with you. Oh, okay. It doesn't have the, the lugs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's in like really nice shape. Yeah, no, it's like bright white. Yeah, like it's it's super minty. Um, and it works, um, but just wanted to like, you know, get it some, get it some love. Yeah. And I didn't start with an SX-70 like you. Um, I started with an SLR-680. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And 
film camera retrofitted that one for me. Um, Cause I had it for like a month and then it like broke afterwards. Um, the light sensor. Oh yeah. It like flaked out and it just started overexposing like every shot. Um, yeah. And I sent it down to Brooklyn film camera and they promised me they would turn it around in like a certain time period. And then, you know, that didn't happen. I got it back eventually and it's worked pretty okay. But now the flash is starting to, uh, to get janky on me. Oh, uh, um, but it's still kicking pretty good. That's good. Yeah. I, but I got the, oh, so these finally came in from, um, retrospect so this will also, also be heading down to you okay okay um yeah the casings they look so good yeah i like the clear ones yeah so this will be for that silver one they built so yeah like for for people tuning in that have no idea zane is like the master blaster when it comes to um rebuilding polaroid cameras and so he did a couple of cool ones for me. This is uh, this is one of them there, a, a silver SLR 680. That's just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, um, I, I wish they would have originally made them in Chrome. Like that would have been so cool. Yeah, it would have been so so cool. Um, but Retrospect has made these really cool clear top. Yeah. And so this all silver baby that, that Zane made for me is going to get this clear guy right there. So you can see through all the goodies. Um, yeah. And then this one, it, it's got, you know what's wrong with it. We'll, we'll, <laughs> um, but then my OG SLR 680, the one that, that BFC fixed up for me um, that needs some love. I got the, the smoked one for that. Oh, nice. Um, and the smoked one looks so dang cool. Like, it's um, retrospect. They're really cool, man. It was awesome, like, dealing with their online peeps and everything. And, yeah. Like, I was I was thoroughly impressed with what it was like to deal with them. But, um, yeah, that's the smoked case there. That's really cool. I, w I wish I was able to, to do injection molding. I just don't have room for that. Yeah. yeah, Dan, Dan, if you, like, go online, uh, I think you have to email them, maybe. Yeah, you, you have to you have to email them, um, and then they'll send you a custom invoice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just say, hey, I want, like, one of each. Is like, I think that'll look really cool on, on the all-black guy. Um, yeah. It's just too bad they didn't make a, a smoke that matches the, the power. Oh, range. yeah, no, that's, the, that's the exact same one that I have. I got somebody's camera on my desk right now, but yeah, I have it on there for testing. But yeah, I got the clear one because I love clear electronics. Yeah, I, I replaced the shell on my on my Nintendo Switch with like the atomic purple because I was like, I, I, I if I could get anything clear, I pretty much will. Oh, the clear stuff is so cool. I, like fun. when I was a kid, and I'm gonna age myself a little bit here, but when the, the movie Hackers came out, when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 1995 movie act, Hackers. Yeah, the, the 1995 the classic. classic with, uh, <laughs> with the, Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie and uh, John. Um, oh, fuck, I can't remember his his name now. But he was in uh, Train Spotting. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But the clear Mac laptops they had in that movie, like just. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Like oh. that that stuff just killed me. Um, yeah, really. That's, that's definitely my favorite '90s like trend was like clear electronics. <laughs> yeah, the clear dude, the clear electronics was such a, a cool, cool thing, and I, I learned about this thanks to YouTube during the uh, the pandemic. I watched a lot of YouTube, um, but apparently, like the big trend of clear electronics started because of the prison system. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. they could make electronics that they couldn't sneak shit through. So, or hide shit inside the electronics. Or exactly. So for everyone that loves clear electronics, we can thank um, all the incarcerated folks that made that happen. Yeah, that's 
See, I think, yeah, that was definitely worth it. You know? <laughs> Um, with Ariel, David says that uh, you saved his Mint SLR 670X, uh, which he dropped. I, I couldn't, I couldn't save the. So they, those come with like the metal skin. I couldn't save those because it was like impossible. Like I tried so hard to get it to get a, that off. It's a metal skin. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like a, a CNC or laser. I don't know. I don't know how they cut it, but it, it's like a it's like a uh, like a metal. Oh wow! And it's pretty cool, but like it, it bent whenever I was trying to take it off, and I was just like, I, I can't save this. Like I, I, I tried like heating it up, but it, it was like because it was metal, it was kind of just like taking the heat, and like I was afraid if I just kept heating it up, I'd end up melting something. So I was like, okay, I can't really do yeah, that. And it's like, a, and the and the other thing is that like it's a it was, it's a black bodied camera, um, and all of the plastic on those, if you start using solvents on them. Like even even something as like weak as, as alcohol, it'll yeah. lift the dye. Oh well. So it'll start looking like real nasty and kind of like dirty, um, and it'll feel weird. It's like it basically like removes like the, the coating and like some of the dyes and stuff like that. A so, lot of the time. So I I couldn't I couldn't use like alcohol or anything to like lift it. So that was kind of a bummer. Yeah, that's. So. Nice. Um. So what got, like, how did you get into the, the camera repair? Like, from being a fan and shooting Polaroids at parties and stuff, how did that end up to being, like, you know, one of the the best dudes doing Polaroid stuff now? Um, what happened was I, like, I don't know, like, maybe three years ago, I got myself an SLR 680, um, but it the autofocus didn't work specifically because okay. it had it had this, the issue that like that happens to like a lot of sonar models or it'll get like it'll it'll only focus between like three and five feet um okay. so i was like looking into getting it repaired by somebody um and i didn't really have any i didn't have like any money at the time so i was like okay i, I kind of want to see if i could repair it myself um so like i fit i i i had to dig and figure out like what was causing that issue yeah um and then i found out that it was like a pickoff and i was like okay cool so i bought like a, a, a cheap uh broken uh sonar camera and i pulled a pickoff out of that one and it luckily worked so i i, re I installed the new pickoff into that one i had to like i had to like cut down my own screwdriver and all that stuff because it uses like the the crappy one millimeter by one millimeter screw bits on all of it for folks um, who may not know, what, what's the pickoff? Um, the pickoff is it, it's this component that consists of um, an IR uh, transistor and an LED, an IR LED specifically. Okay. Um, so there's like, actually, I might have a sonar down here in my parts pen. Okay, yeah, actually, I do. Okay. So um, the pickoff, I don't have one on here because I think I pulled it out for something. Um, it would sit right here in this little little area, this little window. Okay. Uh, basically, it shines light through this uh, encoder wheel right here. And as that spins and as the motor spins, basically, based on, like, where the IR transducer, like, decides, like, where the, the you know, the focus distance is, it'll count those little holes on the rotary encoder. Okay. And then tell it to stop. So, basically, like, if that goes out, it... it you know, it's not getting any response from the actual like rotary encoder or the, the pickoff itself. Um, so the camera will just stop it. It'll be like, oh, okay, that's it. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't know what to do with it. So it'll just it'll just stop it between that like that range, pretty much. Um, and that that's actually like a part um, that I redesigned and open source because I felt bad about pulling out um, pickoffs from uh, like broken you know sonars or working sonars or the pronto sonar cameras because those like the box cameras yeah that have sonar those also have pickoffs so i used to like pull the pull the pickoffs out of those um but th that was like 30 dollars maybe a camera so it'd be a pretty expensive part um and i remember seeing that um uh second shot had remade those pickoffs so i knew it was possible 
Um, so I kind of like, I had to figure, like I may actually like making the housing of the pickoff was pretty easy. Like I had to learn it, learn how to use CAD. Like that was the first time I ever used CAD. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was, it was like, it was a matter of like finding the right components that would work within the camera and were like the right size and then designing a housing around that, that I could put in one of these. Um, I, I'm like, we're, I'm working on like a redesign of it because um, recently uh, I think it's because, so I, 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 I print, I print the housings off on a, on a resin 3d printer. Okay. Um, because it, it requires like, like the tolerances on those, on those parts are like really tiny. Like I think the window is like, like less than a 10th of a millimeter wide pretty much. And the only thing that can, that can do that is like a resin printer. But the problem with that is that like, it's not very opaque. And you need it to be as opaque as possible in order to uh, uh, basically block enough light so it only like sees the windows itself, pretty much. Because if if if, if you don't have it opaque enough and it's only and it's 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 able to shine around the other uh, what's it called like the other holes in the rotary encoder. Okay. Um, it'll cause like. A, a similar issue but like a worse one pretty much where it'll like not it'll, it won't hit the proper sonar focused target as often um so what i've been trying to do is like within the space of um that sonar module um i've been trying to make everything as thick as possible because i, I don't want to have to spend time like doing post-processing like painting them and making sure that the actual window is like still open and stuff like that um so i'm like yeah, but the, the the problem with that is that like now there's like a component shortage for, for everything and even those even those those simple parts that i need are like impossible to get unless i want to like buy them for like five times the cost right now so the chip shortage is even affecting that kind of stuff yeah because it's like it's it's a technically like especially the um well they're, they're both semiconductors like that's that's kind of the uh -oh. issue so yeah that makes sense yeah it's it's just kind of it, it's you know it's affecting everything like i mean even uh like making uh like sometimes i'll give boards away for like open sx70 like i can't really do that right now because everything's like impossible to get and like it's like all like a year out <laughs> even I, now i appreciate you very much <laughs> oh yeah no problem dude um Oh shit! I can show, dude. So this is this is what's up with with this one. See how it's like the the fins don't like the the thing that's supposed to cover. It's like broken. It doesn't grip. It doesn't grip up or like what? No, like here. you can see right through it. See? Yeah. It's so it's like pull, can you fold it like this? Can you fold it like this and then show it like? Like just with like the top part up. Oh yeah. What the hell? I'm yeah, it just like never goes up. It's all like stuck and like well, that's annoying. Yeah, I could replace those. Yeah. Other than that, this one is new. This, okay. this, like this this camera is super super duper dope. I love this one very, very much. Um that's the only thing. But I okay. I bet you like it was something that happened in shipping the first time and we just missed Probably. it. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, Isn't FedEx, it... like, nuked those cameras. Ah, oh, dude, that was so sad. I felt so bad for Rod, because, like... Yeah, his cameras got, like, completely destroyed. Yeah, like, that was... Like, oh, that was... That, that was the other thing, too, is, um... For the silver guy, the, um... Uh, the half press doesn't always work. Is it? Oh, really? Can we get different buttons for these? Um, like the the um, shutter button is like all fucked on it. Yeah, no, I can I can look at the shutter button too. Okay. Yeah, because like sometimes to get it to fire, I have to like rub it in like. Really? <laughs> yeah, and it's it sucked because like I've missed a couple of like. Yeah, I was so buttons. mad after that happened because like I. So what happened was, so I packed everything up, 
Yeah. Um, but I brought it into FedEx because I had to I had to get it shipped to Rod. Yeah. And they like unpacked it in front of me because they like I guess they had to check it or whatever. Oh, so I don't I don't I guess they might have like put it back in like in a really like weird way because I don't understand how those cameras got like that destroyed. Oh, uh, dude, it was so. A little bit of a backstory here for everyone on the chat. Um, so, Diary of a Film Waster, aka Rod, who's a, a great Polaroid pal from Toronto. Um, him and I sent a bunch of SX70s and SLR 680s down to uh, to Zane to get some magic worked on them, and what and to also share shipping because um, shipping things in and out of Canada sucks. Like it's it really so I. I still have to pay UPS for the last shipment. I keep forgetting. And, oh. you know, but um, when Rod picked up the package, he said it looked like it was the package from the scene of Ace Ventura Pet Detective when he's like <laughs> doing that like football <laughs> moves down. <laughs> he's just like, I braced for the worst. And what was it? Two of the four that I sent were okay but all of his were destroyed yeah like completely like it snapped the uh the flashboard in the six in his 680 oh shit yeah like it snapped it which is why i was like 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 no matter how i would have packed that like it was almost like i got run over and they just like they just like well put it back on the truck (laughs) It was it was insane. Like I I couldn't like I don't I don't know. I mean it got fixed. Like I fixed them, but it was still. I gotta say though. So while we were you were you were talking there earlier, and I was dicking around with my six eighty. That's the first shot I've ever done with the Power Ranger. Mm-hmm. It sounds scary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the Power Ranger outputs like six point five volts yeah so basically it like it kind of like over like over volts the the motor so it spins faster so that's what you, and that, you're hearing like all the gears spinning like a lot faster than they normally do yeah like when it fired up i was just like holy shit this thing's like turbocharged now yeah yeah no it's it's pretty that, crazy that could be interesting for some expired films though where it's like mm-hmm. um when when it gets a little sludgy in the um in the mix yeah like for i i bet that that could be interesting yeah i i also do that um so i whenever i shoot like whenever i've shot like um expired like even if even if the batteries work um the what i'll do is um i'll i'll cover the battery terminals just so i don't like have an extra battery on it yeah i was gonna ask about that because um so for, for anyone that's not sure here, what Zane and I are talking about is I, I bought one of these Power Ranger things from, was it Res, Resvoit? Resvoit, yeah. Resvoit um, from, um, is it Southeast Asia? Uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's Taiwan. Taiwan, yeah. It, it's this beautiful, beautiful um, device that um, he's made that bolts into the tripod socket of your Polaroid camera and Mm -hmm. it's really easy to make it work because all you do is use an included tool that they have to just poke two holes yeah above the the tripod socket and then you put on the Power Ranger and you order a a crazy lithium-ion battery and now you can run i-type film in your camera without having to um, do any battery tricks or anything like that um, and this is the first time I fired it up because right before the chat, I, I drove down to RP Electronics in Burnaby um, out here and picked up a couple of these um, these batteries because I was having a devil of a time trying to track them. Oh, down. yeah. Um, so this is the first time I played with it. And, man, it sounds crazy. Like, I, yeah. I, I saw Zane, but here, I'll, I'll do another one because um, It's Nick wants a uh, – or it It's Knick – wants um a sound so let's see how it goes here oh i gotta turn it on first i think i think it was already on 
No, it, it was it's charging right now. Oh, okay, okay. But the um, the only thing I don't like about it is how long you have to hold the button down. And it's a stiff button. <laughs> it's a really stiff button. Yeah. Like I thought it was broken at first, and then like hey, maybe you get, you just gotta hold it down, and yeah, you gotta hold it down for a real long time. Yeah. Even the autofocus sounds like. Yeah, I mean everything's overvolted. It's crazy. Okay, so I'm gonna move it closer so we can hear the audio. All right, say cheese, Zane. Cheese. That's so crazy. It just spits it out. <laughs> just so fast. Yeah, no, I, I love mine. It, li it literally lives on my alpha. Like, I don't take it off usually. Like, I, I mean, I'll take it well, Okay, I take it off, like, if I'm if I'm testing other people's cameras. Um, because I literally, I'll if I don't have a skin on the bottom of it, like, if I'm doing, like, a full CLA of it, like, I literally it will just take this and I'll just put it on the bottom of the camera. Even if it doesn't have, like, a tripod socket, I'll just stick it in there. That way it's powering the camera and I'll hold it. Um, and it lets me, you know, calibrate cameras just using high type film, so I can do that even cheaper as well. Yeah, I gotta agree with it. it uh, I feel like Dan, it, it is kind of scary. Like the first time that it fired, it yeah, scary. it spooked me a little tiny bit. Like I don't know if anyone noticed that on the live, but I put in a, a pack of eye type in here, and when I powered it up and it shot the dark slide out, I was like. It, it surprised me a little tiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, that's cool, though. I'm really excited to play with that more. Yeah. And, um, especially with the um, Open SX70 camera that you, you built out for me. So yeah. Zane um, made me this really beautiful um, sonar with, um, with an Open SX70 um, board in it. And um, mostly to play in in the studio because I like doing a lot of Polaroid stuff. Yeah. In the studio. And um, you know, it comes with this this cool little little dongle that I'm terrified of breaking. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're like really resilient. I think the only time I've killed one um, is like I I left it in my in like one of my pants pockets and then I washed it. Okay. But like, I think obviously like detergent will kill it, but um, like just touching it isn't a big deal. Like you're not gonna you're not gonna kill it. Yeah, but what I'm really stoked about is the the PC sync board here because up until this camera came along to play with Polaroids in in the studio, I was using that um, that Mint flash bar. Yeah. Only for the port because otherwise that flash bar sucks and is kind of useful. oh yeah i yeah i try not to use it as much um because yeah it's like it's real dinky <laughs> like, it just, like it, it's pretty much like you have to be like taking a picture of somebody like five feet away and that's it or like right in their face like yeah it's, it's so it, it's so it, weak if, if you could like assign a physical action to a flash it'd be like Meh. yeah Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> it's just terrible. Um, there's a question here. Is there any worry of the gears wearing down faster? What do you think of that with the extra juice? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, there's enough for the gear trains to, to know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really think, I don't really think it'll wear them down um, as long as everything's like running smoothly in your camera. Okay. Um, I, I've only seen like a few stripped gear trains, but those are like on just normal use SX seventies. It might it might have like had like some get jammed and then it just stripped itself. But like that's fair. I, those are so few and far between. Like I, I've only seen like two of them, maybe one or two. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. Because if, if everything's running correctly, like, it should just spin faster, pretty much. Like, what, what'll strip it is resistance. Mm. So. So, what about if you put in, like, a pack of janky expired stuff, and it's, like, sludged up, and it gets caught in the gears, and it binds it up so it can't shoot out? Do you think that might strip it? I don't think so. It shouldn't, at least. Um Again, like all, all I would all, all I would say is that like if you got like expired stuff 
and the battery could be like dying. Um, just tape, I would recommend tape up the bottom. Like, yeah, just tape tape up the bottom of the pack and then stick it in. That's what that's what I always do. Like any any expired like original six hundred, uh, the Time Zero that I shot recently, uh, I I use like an external battery of some sort, like either the Reservoir Kit or like um, I was sent um, this Pola Studio. Ooh, that one looks. Battery. Right. I yeah, I, I like it. I mean, um, but is that that's a replacement bottom though, right? Yeah, it's a replacement bottom, so it only it would only really go with like, uh, like for this one specifically, like like the black body cameras. Mm. Um, the the one thing I don't I don't know if it's like because I I've talked to some people about it like that also have it, um, and it might just be my unit. I don't know if like maybe I got like a a, a weird one, but um. It turns off like real fast because <laughs> it auto shuts off, um, which okay. is kind of weird. So like, you got pretty much on. Yeah, so I mean, it's just like a one button like push, um, which isn't that big a deal. It just takes like a second to go back there. Like every time I'm about to shoot, I'll like turn it on. Um, but if it's not like getting enough power draw, what it'll do is it'll just shut off. And like sometimes if I forget, like I'll go to take a picture and then it's, it's not doing anything and. Um, you know, um, but I mean, it looks it looks like aesthetically nice. I think the only other thing that I don't like as much about it is that like since it juts out more, like it's kind of weird to put it up to your to your face because you kind of okay. kind of jam it into your chin. But I'm just trying to check out the Polo Studio thing, and their their web my router is telling me that I can't go to their website because it might be unsafe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is is it Pola Studio online? Is that the one? Uh here let me I think it might be. And yeah. Dan says I might or uh, where is it? Oh sorry. The mint flash versus the SLR 680. It is a huge difference. So when I take portraits of people with the 680, I warn them that it's going to be like the sun is about to shit on their face. And um, the, the SLR 680's flash is real good. <laughs> well, it's so aggressive. <laughs> yeah, it's aggressive, but I mean, at least it like it actually will light up your scene. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so crazy. Um, but I, I dig it. Like it's, it's been one of my most favorite cameras. Um, I like it for like parties and stuff too. Not that we can really do that any as much yeah. the, the world and stuff, but, um, because of the sonar autofocus, even if you're in low light, you can still yeah. get some really cool shots with it just yep. because, um, someone says we shan't speak of my original trash sonar. Oh, that sounds like there's a story there. <laughs> oh, the Nissan Flash, that is a mega chunky one. So I got one of those with an SX-70 right before I went on a road trip last year. And that is a honking beast as well. I don't know where it is right now. I, it's kind of vanished in the move, but yeah, it definitely is brighter than the 680. Um, but it also like... It's got, I think, four or six batteries that fire that thing up. Um, so it's that thing is is a chunk and a half. Um, mm -hmm. an absolute beast. So, out of curiosity, though, so you, you got into um, repairing the Polaroids just out of necessity because you broke your own, and then you're obviously a very curious dude. And, um, you know, your curiosity started getting you down this rabbit hole of other Polaroid stuff. The Open SX-70 um, stuff, how did that end up um, um, happening? So I'd been following the project for, like, um, probably, like, at that point, a couple years, maybe, at that point. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how long. But then I saw that, that Joaquin posted. Um, and this was, like, whenever I was already, like, repairing cameras at this point. Um, but I saw that jo Joaquin posted, um, uh, like, uh, requesting, um, like, some original Fairchild PCBs. Okay. Um, hmm. And I had some. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Um, How did so you I, have some of those? Oh, they, they, were just, they were just in Model 1s. 
Okay. So, so like I, um, I took them out and then I, I mailed them off to him and then he sent me, um, a kit and I was like really excited about that. Um, so I threw it in, um, originally with my white alpha to have like over here. So this is like, this is the camera that I, I first put it into. Um, oh, that looks so good. Yeah, and I, I, I changed the button to yellow on this one. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I threw it in there and then I was messing around with it. And so, I, I mean, I, I do like for my, for my day job, I, I program. So I was like looking at the code and I was like, oh, I mean, this would be kind of fun to like mess with. So I started uh, changing things how <laughs> I kind of wanted them. Um, and then eventually um, Joaquin started letting me push specifically like to the actual uh, main repository. So I've been working on that directly ever since. So uh, anybody who has an Open SX70 kit uses my code now for the most part. Um, wow. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's been it's been pretty fun. I've been working on, I've been working on uh, that with with other people. So there's like Abel, and then um, there's uh, Hans in Germany. Um, Joaquin, uh, in the beginning, was working on it. He I, he hasn't committed anything in like a year or so. Um, it's mostly been. But yeah, Hans did Hans did like the sonar code, so I kept that. Um, and it's kind of, I mean, I, I guess at that, it's been kind of like, we did some nice trip. Oh yeah. Yeah. We were, yeah. Uh, Ethan and I were like having to like debug some stuff. Uh, and I think that turned out specifically to be his dongle because for some reason, like, I guess, uh, it was damaged. So like one of the bits on the hex encoder was like not working. So I had to I had to send them a new one of those. So I think it came damaged from like the actual like manufacturer itself. Oh, that's a bummer. Oh yeah, I, that, I mean it's not that big a deal. I just I just had to whip up a new one. I did have a question with the dongle. So the two switches, mm -hmm. what do? You? Uh, switch one um, is the multiple exposure mode. So it's like in camera multiple exposures. Ooh. Um, the, the bad, the bad thing about it, just because of how, um, the, the camera works, um, is you can't look through the viewfinder after you've taken the first shot because yeah. the, the act of putting the, 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 the mirror down ejects the film. Oh, uh, okay. So you have to, you have to flip up the, uh, the mirror after the first one, you keep the shutter closed. And then you can take another shot, another shot, however many shots you want to do. Um, but you kind of have to, you have to guess your focus. You have to do like, you have to manually focus. Even with the sonar, sadly, um, we, we, I tried like getting the, um, uh, what's it called? The, the, the autofocus to work in like whenever the shutter was closed. Oh, but I don't it think it has like an interlock or something that stops it when. No, it, I mean, it's, it's not that it'll, it'll move the lens, but I think there's not enough power for the actual like, logic to to decide when it needs to stop because it'll go to the minimum focus distance every time so if you have the shutter closed like it'll it'll if you have the shutter closed and you try to autofocus it'll it'll go to the minimum focus distance if you try to autofocus so it won't focus properly um and that so and then switch to like bouncing off of that um that's the self timer mode okay so, um, you you turn it on and then I can just do this real quick because I could I could turn I could close my door. Well, actually, never mind. Now that I'm thinking but, about it, you know um, the Hollywood dongle over there. Oh yeah, I got I got the I got the fancy one thanks to Joaquin. It was That's nice cool. enough to send me one, so I I got the I got I got the super cool one. Um, but yeah, it's like the self timer. So. Um, you know, after 10 seconds, it'll, it'll take the shot. Um, one thing that we were trying to do on that, um, which it'll work on the alpha, but it won't work on the sonar because of the autofocus component of it. I mean, I guess it, it would technically work only in manual. Um, 
but uh, it was it's pre flipping the mirror up during that self timer so you could reduce like uh, camera shake for oh. the shot. So you set up on a tripod, you'd hit the the shutter button, it would flip the mirror up with the with the shutter closed off, obviously, um, count down and then fire the shot and eject. Um, and we were trying to get that to work with with autofocus. Um, but that all that was that was whenever I figured out that it doesn't work because I was trying to take like a, like a self portrait um, and have it do like all the autofocus stuff, um, but it, it wouldn't do it with with the sole with like the shutter closed because the solenoid has to be on for the shutter to be closed. So that's taking quite a bit of power. Um, but what what I what I do instead on the sonars if I want to have the autofocus is I just don't have the premiere flip. Um, sadly, I mean it, it would be cool to have that, but it's like not the most you know necessary feature. And I can do that on the Alpha because the Alpha doesn't have the autofocus. Doesn't have the autofocus, so I don't really have to care. Nice. Yeah. So, just you know, I, I guess the question with the Open SX70 stuff, and maybe you, this is more of a question for um, uh, Joaquin than you, is um, it's just kind of been like a shared project sort of thing, and more of a, than a product kind of thing so far eh? so it's just mm -hmm. you know if you know someone that knows you can kind of get in on it type thing is that going to change at some point like would this be more open for people if they wanted to uh be upgrading their um sx70s and yeah so joaquin so yeah i mean half of that i guess would be more of a question for for joaquin so there i know i know he's working on um making that a product separate from open sx70 it wouldn't be the same thing mm -hmm. um, i don't i don't know what all the details on that um but as far as like the open sx70 side goes um it it, it does definitely have like a, a really big barrier to entry just just, just by nature of of the pro project itself so like you know you you have to be able to if you're going to do it yourself you have to be able to uh, you know, work on these cameras, you have to know how to, how they work. Um, if you don't have the PCBs assembled by like PCB way or something like that, um, you would have to uh, hand solder the P PCBs, which can be tedious because like, they're like, especially like on the sonars, there's like a lot of tiny, tiny little SMD components on them. And that's not something that like a lot of people can do. Um, and then once, even even if you get it like made by, um, you know, somebody else, like at like a at like a fab factory, like PCB way or something like that, um, somebody still has to program them because all the all the eighteen mega microcontroller chips uh, come blank. So okay. you have to you have to program them with um, an external programmer. So this is like the ICSP headers on there. So either you would do that before you install the chip on here using like a, uh, a what's it called? A, um, uh, like a, with, with, the, with the same programmer. I mean, it, it uses the same thing with like a socket. Basically like a socket. So, you know, you'd have like a zip socket here. And this is like my ICSP header. So I stick that on the board and then use some external software to actually like flash the initial um, build onto the thing. And then after that, like you can program it over, um, the FTDI cable. It's just a matter of getting, uh, that bootloader on there that would actually be able to talk to the computer and then program the chip on the chip itself. Um, which there's a lot of steps there. So it's kind of, I, I, I don't, I don't see that side, um, getting any easier, um, just because, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult. Um, I've had like a lot of people ask if like I would I would do that as like a service and I like I don't because it's against the license. <laughs> like I'll give them away. So like like in your case, like I'll I'll put it in, in one of your cameras. Um, but like you know every every time I every time I give away one of those boards, I like I spend a lot of my own money and time on it because I, I i again like I, I always get like blank boards i sit there and i, I hand solder everything um and that takes time um and you know it's <laughs> it's a process so 
I greatly appreciate it, man. Like this, it's one of my favorite, one of my favorite cameras. Like I, th- I think will end up happening once the two six eighties are done, um, and and this guy is all done, and I get a white one. Like the rest of them are just gonna get sold. Like that'll probably be what I keep it to. Is just yeah, four of them should be plenty. Yeah, no, I, I only, the only ones that I, I mainly use, well, I, I got a 680 that I have to fix up because I want to, I want to just have like a 680 just to, just to have one. Um, but I only, I only mainly use like my alpha and then my sonar because I mean, it's not like I need like several different cameras. Like those can do anything. <laughs> and then if I need them yeah, to do yeah. something else, I can make them do something else and you got me thinking about this Polis Studio thing, though. It looks really cool. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm half tempted to maybe order one and um, get you to throw it on the that SX-70 sonar. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that would be kind of dope to have, like, just permanent power on that one. That, mm-hmm. That's easy. Um, yeah. I, I think this one's ended up being like one of the the more the more nerdy chats I've had, where it's like we've gotten into uh, like really talking about the gear stuff, which is oh yeah, I, I mean I could I could talk a long time about all of that, pretty much. So, I, mean, <laughs> I don't so mind because like I mean these these things are such a marvel, like, mm-hmm. and. They it kind of they kind of blow me away because I remember like the first time I saw one of these online, it was like an immediate like object of desire. It was like I want one. And then I saw how yeah. much, and it's like, oh man, they're so expensive. If you just like look at eBay, but then if you get kind of lucky, you can find some good deals on them here. And yeah. There. Um, but I went from being like I don't think I could ever have one to like. I have like literal stacks of them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if they if they grab hold of you, like you end up going off the deep end whenever it comes to the whole thing. Like I, they're definitely like my favorite camera. Like it, they're, the, they're the ones that I use the most. Not just because like I fix them and I have to use I have to use them a lot, um, but like they're just a blast to use. Yeah, and just when people, like, when you pull one out and you're like, oh, can I take your picture? And you pull this out and people kind of are like, what? And then you pop it open and you're like, all right. And they're, they're like, what did what did you just do? Like, yeah. And it, it's wild because, like, you know, Dr. Land's teams came up with this in, like, mm-hmm. what, the late 60s, early 70s? And it still captivates attention and the imagination so much like decades later like oh yeah i don't think a cooler camera has been made Mm. since then like you know it's um they're just they're they're so cool oh yeah yeah like i just i'll I'll never i'll never get tired of them like Mm. question though so there's there's a funny misnomer out there, and maybe you can quash this. These are all plastic, even the silver ones, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it's when people are like, oh yeah, I've got an aluminum SX, and it's like, no, you don't. Yeah, you, you got you got a it's like a, a nickel chrome something else alloy that's uh, literally just like plated on top, yeah. like it, it uh the same metal. I, I have I have some somewhere, uh, like especially like the sonars. For some reason, it seems like the plating doesn't like stick as well for for like, especially like the viewfinder pieces. Mm. Um, if you peel off the skin a little bit too roughly, you can rip that that plating off like real easily. Oh shit! Really? Yeah, yeah. Because there's there's like a a little top piece. I guess probably where it was like lowered in, like, probably oh, like sure. attached to something, and then it got lowered in to like whatever plating it was doing like plating system they were doing um and it's basically like this weak point at the top that like it could kind of just like rip open um and i've had that happen before and it kind of sucks um but yeah no they're they're all just plastic they just they just look like that 
I don't think it's a different kind of plastic. It's just a dipped plastic. It's just it's a it's just a dip. <clears throat> it's the same plastic. It's just dyed white. It's just a white plastic on the inside. It, it's wild because it does feel metallic. Like when when I mean the plating is metal. I mean it 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 does it has a it has a metal coating. It's, it's okay. chromed. It's just not. Uh, it's just not fully metal, and I mean it doesn't need to be because if it was, it would be so heavy. Like, oh, it would be insanely heavy. It, it would be awful. <laughs> yeah, see, here, here's that what I was telling you about. So it's like I'm doing the half press, and now, now it's starting to work. But sometimes it just, it's like it's a sleepy button. Oh, yeah, I can replace that. Yeah, it's great though. Like I do love this camera, and then that, you know this focusing screen that you put in it is beautiful like it's yeah, um, yeah. you are you're a master at this it, stuff. It, it's it's fun to have like the the split prism in those like the only the only issue uh, and i mean that's just like because of how you know land wanted the split pr because the split land didn't want the split prism in the first place and like so the first the first couple of models didn't have it yeah um but then uh you know, people come, well, not the first couple of models, the first couple, like, release of the camera, like, like batches, didn't have the, fo like, the split focusing screen. Um, but people really hated it because, you know, it's harder to, it's harder for, like, most people to focus on just, like, a flat uh, frontal lens, pretty much. So, um, after that, they, um, uh, they, they started adding them into the cameras. Uh, but under the stipulation by land that they needed to, it needed to be in the bottom third of the of the frame, which is why the split prism isn't like centered, because uh, he was like, I don't want it to be in the center, I don't <laughs> want it to get in the way or whatever. Even though, again, nobody, I don't think would care. Like most SLRs have a dead center, um, so like whenever you whenever you put like a split prism into like a, a sonar camera, the bad thing is that like the sonar focuses on, focuses off the center of the frame pretty much but the okay. split the split is at the bottom third so in order to like if you want to verify that your sonar is correct you have to focus in the middle which is like right above the um the the split prism and then you have to aim up in order to like verify that your your split is correct okay I didn't know. But, that. I mean, it, does, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if you're like aiming like a flat surface, obviously, because then they would match up. But like, yeah. if you're if you're if it's something like more dynamic, like a face or something like that, if you're like trying to like make sure that you're focusing on like an eye or something, just like a heads up. Um, auto focus with the center, and then you aim up, and use the um, uh, the split to like verify, and then you can shoot. So it, it's 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 a really it's a really weird. <laughs> little thing i mean that, that's why they, that's why they weren't in in the the sonars pretty much but it's like papa lens fuck you where it's just like all right <laughs> yeah you you guys you pushed me on this one but i'm gonna make it difficult for you guys yeah it's literally like the monkey's paw curls like oh yeah you get you get that uh you get that feature but it has to be like inconvenient That's funny. Yeah. I, the, the history of Polaroid just kills me a lot of the time. Like, it's such oh, a, yeah. a fascinating company. The products are so interesting. And, like, it's, I don't know. Like, th these cameras still are just so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and just even when you dig into the history of stuff, like, the sonar, I, I love that the autofocus has roots into, like, defense technology. Like, that's such a crazy yeah. It's like, you know, every time you use your sonar or SLR 680, you're basically using a baby version of the original missile guidance system. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like, it's just, they're, <laughs> they're cool. I, I really like them. So, do you, like, outside of building the... Um, the SX-70s and things like that. Um, do you have any other projects that uh, have been keeping you busy or that you have your eye on to uh, dive into? Uh, like projects as in what? 
um, like photography projects or just like, you know, projects of um, what you're wanting to, oh, I feel like Dan says, wait, missile guy system. Yeah, so before jumping into Zane's project stuff, the sonar in the SX-70s and sonar cameras is a derivative from a missile guidance system that Polaroid built for the US military during World War II. Because um, that's actually where Polaroid made most of their money to become who they were, like what we knew them as, was as defense contractors. So they made just, originally they made a ton of money making the polarized lenses and that's what kind of gave them the capital to start building the land cameras and instant film and all that. Um, but then what really gave them the, the deep war chest um, to allow them to do crazy things like make color instant film and all of that. Was, was the war chest. <laughs> literally the war chest. <laughs> and, um, that's actually where SX-70 gets its name from. So Polaroid, when they were doing defense contracts, <clears throat> they named all of the government contracts they were working on special experiments with a number designation or SX and a number designation. And the last project they did for the US military was SX-69. And when Dr. Land wanted them to build this camera in the integral film, he didn't want competitors to know that they were working on a new photography project. So they designated it SX-70 so that all of their competitors just assumed that all of these funds and all these resources and like Polaroid being busy on this SX-70 project was building like a whole new factory and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. It, it was the perfect guys for them to be to to do all this stuff because none of their competitors would question it because you know oh they must be just working on something crazy for the military and of course the military is going to spend all this money so yeah. a new factory and like all this stuff isn't out of the question. And then, you know, fast forward to the um, the shareholders meeting where Dr. Land walks out and he just like pulls this out pops it open, puts a flash bar on it and takes a picture and everyone's like, holy shit, what the hell? Like, you know, that's, that was wild. And they just stuck with SX-70 is the name of the product when uh, they launched it. And uh, yeah. I don't even know what they would have, like, what they could have even named it. <laughs> like anything else would have been really, really stupid. They probably like workshopped that for a while. They were like, look, SX-70 sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound cool and like even without knowing like the background of where it came from it's still cool but then when you learn the background you're like okay it's even fucking cooler like it's um yeah there, there's a ton of really great polaroid books and resources out there um to to read this stuff that are absolutely fascinating but um the best one that i found to really get in the nitty-gritty of the company was lands polaroid um, what was the name of the guy that was that one? Uh, and Polaroid book. Let's see what the internet says here. Lance Polaroid, a company and the man who invented it by Peter C. Wensberg. It's been long out of uh, print, but you can sometimes find um, old copies of it online and stuff. And I would super recommend looking for one or, you know, if you have a library card or even know what a library is in 2021, you know, roll on down to your library and see if they happen to have a copy of it there. But that one's filled with all sorts of great, great tidbits of like, you know, the SX-70 production, when they made color film, like the inner workings of what that company was before they ejected Papa Land and created the downfall. And um, when you start learn, like reading all this stuff and learning about it, you kind of realize the the saddest part of the whole Polaroid story is that what killed Polaroid was Land himself. Yeah, like, you know it's it's an amazing story of like what he created, but he also just he created this vacuum that as soon as his presence was no longer there, it just imploded on itself. And, yeah, yeah. Amazing story, though. It's, um, yeah. I mean, there, there's a reason why so many of us still like shooting it today or get drawn into it, because it's a great story. 
And I, I'm kind of curious to hear like your take on what you think about this, but um, a lot of people have like talked shit about like recent formulas and stuff and how like, you know, impossible and the Polaroid originals and now Polaroid could have done a better job or like haven't done as good of a job. But like, honestly, I think for what they've been working on and what they've done, they've done great. And I actually kind of like new iType cameras a lot. Um, I'm probably going to end up buying like a Now Plus because I really love my one step uh, uh, two player the one step plus. I like that one a lot. Um, I think it's great, but a lot of people out there don't because they feel like they should have stayed more true to, you know, what Polaroid uh, was before. You know, what, are, what do you think about that? I'm, I'm kind of in the latter camp <laughs> <laughs> to be, to be completely, I mean, I don't know. I'm split. I'm split on that kind of a little bit. Um, because so <sighs> I, okay, if, if I if I had to compare Polaroid currently to um, Impossible, um, I would definitely I I definitely miss Impossible a lot more as like the whole company structure goes, because um, they used to do like workshops. They used to do. Yeah. You know, like, there, there used to be, like, the whole, like, brown bag specials for, like, expired film. Like, there, yeah. there was, like, there was a lot more, like, community building, specifically, um, surrounding Impossible. Like, I mean, it was still, like, a company. Like, I mean, I'm not going to get disillusioned with that. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's the, it's, it's, it's capitalism at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, while, while, Doc, while Doc was there, like, you know, it was, it was, there was definitely, like, a heart somewhere in there doing something while the film wasn't as like amazing as it is the now. The film is better now. The film is better yeah. now. Um, I do, I do just really miss the, uh, I, I guess the, the focus on legacy film shooters that existed in impossible. Um, because, Polaroid, I mean, it makes sense. Like, they're, they're obviously, like, targeting, like, the Instax Urban Outfitters kind of demographic uh, yeah. with, with all of their stuff. Like, if, if, you, if, you, look at, if you look at, like, their, their Instagram page, it's, like, entirely, like, conventionally attractive models and people. And, uh, you know, it, it's an entire focus, obviously, on their newer cameras because, you know, you want to sell the newer cameras. You want to sell the film that you have a wider margin on. Um, so, like, I... I guess, I guess my view on it, like, I, and I also, I, I do, I do like the current formulations of the film. Like, it, they're like fantastic. Like, you're all grab the stack that I have over here. Um, One, so I, I think I'm in a similar camp to you where um, I, I like what they've done with the film now. And I, I don't hate them for the film. I understand why eight instead of 10, a lot of people may not realize that, but you know, a big part of why it's it's eight shots instead of ten shots was um, when Impossible started making this new film. They didn't even call it Polaroid film originally; they called it Polaroid compatible film because yeah, that's really what the Polaroid film we have today is. It's Polaroid compatible film, unless you buy an <laughs> iType camera. iType cameras have been designed to work within the limitations of the eight shots, but um, the film cartridge this the design of the film cartridge they never changed it so this is the same design that polaroid originally built and the problem and, and you may have noticed this if you shot expired film um and compared the expired frames to impossible frames or the now new polaroid is that the original frames are much thinner they're a little more flimsy they're yeah. a, a little um yeah know, actually I, I have some expired 600 here so yeah, like it's, it's super thin. Yeah, it's like it's super thin. Like, and I so that's why that's why we were able to put ten shots inside of this yeah. little package. Is the the film is thinner? Um, so, yeah. So the uh, we'll 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 get exact. <laughs> so okay, we're getting new. Really film is is point three three millimeters. 
and the old film is like 0.25. That's a huge difference when you start it's a huge difference. each other. Yeah. So that's why we only have eight frames instead of 10. And part of it, um, a, a big reason behind it is um, the Mylar cover. So this is, and, and maybe some, a lot of you probably know this, but but some folks may not know, but the front of a Polaroid, that's not actually the image. That's just a window because under the window is where all the chemical magic happens. And this is why Outcast lied to you. And I've said this before in so many different episodes, never shake it like a Polaroid picture. Outcast will make you ruin your photos if you shake it hard enough because when this first ejects, it's not actually a solid yet. It's still a jelly under this little mylar plastic window. So if you shake it aggressively enough, you, you can end up distorting it, which some people use to their advantage to do like Polaroid art where you can manipulate and play with uh, the image. Yeah, I got, I got to shoot some. So I had a pack of time zero that I hadn't shot. So I, I shot it like this last weekend at Polacon. Just like a bunch of people, I gave gave away the shots because oh, it's uh, such I, nice. Um, somewhere in here, I have my partner manipulated the one I shot of them. I can't find it. It's fine. Um, but yeah, like Time Zero used to be manipulatable. That was pretty cool. Well, and yeah, there was an. There was regular time zero and there was also like an even more manipulatable time zero too that had like even more it was like a thicker emulsion on it where you could really get in yeah that, that was the one that i that was the one that i shot it was like time zero artistic oh shit that's so cool man yeah yeah i i had a pack of it and it it was so cool because it spread perfectly like oh, nice. every shot um which so fun so people people get really really upset about the whole eight shot pack thing so that was original Polaroid film, right? Guess how many shots that that time zero pack had? It's eight shots because it's thicker. It's eight shots. Yeah. Yeah. To to be manipulatable, they had to make them thicker. Yeah, because like that, and um, that was also the film that they used for. Uh, it was a Peter Gabriel album, the one where everything's all melty and stuff. Yeah, um, that was shot on time zero, and they manipulated the photo to be all melty and everything. Yeah, yeah, like that's it's it's such a, a cool film, but yeah, and I love that you busted out the calipers, and we know now. So, <laughs> point three three for um, impossible, and point two five for Polaroid. Um, like I, I have to give them credit though, and I think it's great that they've made us a film where we can still keep shooting our SX-70s and our LSRLs yeah. and our R680s and our box cameras. Because as much as I love the pop-up cameras, I still love fucking with a box camera. Like, they're they're still great. I, I don't personally really use the box cameras. Um, I don't know why. I, there's no real reason. I don't hate them or anything. I have some. I just don't really use them. But, like, modern Polar, like the modern Polaroid film, like, the colors on it, like... It's so nice. If your camera exposed, so like I think that's like what most of the issue is for like a lot of people, is that like if if you've got like a camera that's not exposing properly, you know you yeah. haven't you haven't gotten it serviced or anything like that, like of course you're gonna get crap pictures out of it. Like I mean I don't know what else to say. Like the 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 problem is the the, the film has a very low dynamic range. You have to get it you have to get it you know fixed and set up by somebody that knows what they're doing, be it like retrospect or like myself or something like that. It doesn't matter if you get it. Like if you get your camera fit, like, uh, you know, calibrated CLA, what have you, whatever it needs to have done. Like with the modern film, like it looks great. Like, I mean, like even with, like even with flash, like this was like with a crappy, like flash that I had like a Policon on the side of my camera. Like I was trying, I was doing, I was testing uh, the open SX 70. Yeah. Like, like what like Brent's that. saying, if you, if you shoot it, in, if you shoot it in, like the brightest sun that you can, like you're gonna get you're gonna get crap shots because it's like it's a high contrast scene. Like even yeah. even older Polaroid wouldn't handle it that well. Well, and there's another comment. My brand new film looks great, but I have some year old film that always seems to overexpose. And I mean that that's also a case too. Is like you know some of that film, it, it, those older formulas weren't great, and there's been times where certain batches aren't great either and like 
that's a thing that's kind of like wild when you when you have to think about like these analog films is this isn't always a an automatically consistent thing like you know they have to mix up new batches and stuff so yeah you know there's the odd time where maybe like that one production run they didn't nail it quite perfectly on on something there and that's not something unique to polaroid like that's happened to every film manufacturer and like any kind of manufacturer out there like there, there was that story of Kodak where um, they had film that was being like really janky and unstable. And it turned out it was because the cows that they used for the gelatin uh, for the emulsion had gotten into a mustard field and had eaten a bunch of mustard plants. And that created a bunch of sulfur in their bones so that when they used that in the gelatin, it fucked up the chemistry of the film. Yeah. So it's it's kind of wild to think about that like this film is it's like a living living kind of thing that, that's yeah. so there, there's always going to be like weird things and like you know i get weird aberrations in my film sometimes too depending on um how my rollers are and oh okay so this is what happens with the silver 680 when the mirror gets all janky it'll still fire but then it's like the mirror gets stuck or something and it throws these like extra flares and stuff. That's real weird. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the 680 needs some love. It's okay. <laughs> oh shit. Uh, can you hear me still? Yeah, I can still hear you. There we go. I hit the wrong button and I turned off my my speakerphone. <laughs> I'm officially getting old now and I don't know how technology works. <laughs> it's okay. I barely, I barely know how anything works anymore. Um, but where is it here? I feel it goes back to knowing your camera and working within the limitations of the camera and film. Yeah, and that's a really good point is, you know, regardless if you're shooting Polaroid or if you're shooting... Um, in stacks or you're shooting film, like it's important to know your camera and your your equipment. And if you're playing with different film stocks, the behavior is not. They're all going to behave wildly different from each other. And if you're coming from like digital, where you're used to seeing perfect shit and all that, you know, you're not going to see that at all with Polaroid. <laughs> Yeah, the the, sen the sensors are really basic electronic eye. All it's checking for is, is light intensity, pretty much. Yeah, and it turns that into into like exposure time. So if you're like if you're if you're trying to take take a picture of like a shaded subject with like a bright background, you know you need to use that exp like that, that exposure compensation dial. Like it, it, it's not it's it the the Polaroid doesn't have like matrix metering. Like it's not gonna it's not gonna analyze like your entire scene, like find a face and be like, oh, the face is, you know, you know, EV11 while the background's EV17, you know, we need to expose for here to get the most dynamic range. Like it's not going to do anything like that. It's, it's, it's real, it's, it's an advanced piece of technology for its time period, but it's really dumb. Like you gotta, you gotta guide it where it needs to go. And, and I think that goes back to that uh, comment of like knowing your your equipment and yeah what its limitations are and and working around that because like I've kind of been going the opposite direction the last little bit and I haven't been shooting as much film. Um, I I recently bought a Fuji Film XT2, which uh, oh that's that's the the camera I actually have too. Yeah, and I mean. So I've had to eat a shit ton of crow recently because um, yeah, it, it's it's not a secret how much I fucking hate Fuji. Like I really, really just oh, but crow. their digital cameras are so nice. Oh, <laughs> dude, like it's just I feel like such a fucking hypocritical piece oh, of don't. shit. I I mean but, like I I shoot with mine so this this camera and it's old now like the the XT2 has been around for a year yeah. at this point. It's been it came out 2015 or 16 I think. Yeah. This this thing it's a little wonder to me. Like the the feel of it is so nice. Um like I 
I did get a little grip extension for it here, which makes it feel a little nicer because I have yeah. big meat paws. Yeah, but, I kind of hang over on mine too. So yeah, but um, you know, it's I've been super impressed by how it works. The Fuji glass has uh, like it. <laughs> So a, a friend of mine loaned me his, his 56 1.2 and he's like, here, just try this out and see what you think. And the 56 1.2 um, has become my favorite lens of all time now. Like it's yeah, just, it's so good being able to use the vintage glass on here. So easy. Oh, that's, that's what I, I mean. I mean, this isn't vintage glass, but like I have like, I have an M mount adapter because I, I shoot with my Leica, but I also <laughs> adapt it onto onto my uh my fuji cameras this is just like a, a voigtlander lens but you know you, you i i do like i have i have an adapter for pentax k mount i've got an adapter for fd mount i've got one for nikon like i i, I have an adapter for so many systems for my fuji camera because it's fun just throwing different lenses on it yeah, like it, it is fun throwing the different lenses on it. Like my, my friend who finally, so it was a mixture of Take, who goes by Big Head Taco on, on the Grams and uh, on on YouTube. He's a major um, supporter of, of Fuji and um, like he writes for Fuji Love regularly. And, you know, he's been trying to get me in Camp Fuji. And then my friend Clint, who uh, owns a, a store here called Space Lab, um, he's the one that, that finally like pushed me to, to really look into it because he's got an X pro two that he absolutely loves. And I, I wanted to find an X pro two. They are super hard yeah. to find right now and people still want yeah, yeah. a whole lot of cake for them because the X pro three just really wasn't that wowing compared to the X pro two. Um, but then Take was like, well, why don't you look for an XT two? Yeah. Because it's the same camera, it just doesn't have the optical rangefinder. Yeah, um, and I found a really good deal on this, and it's been a slippery slope because um, I mean, I have to I have to give Fuji a lot of props on this one now. Um, but I've also noticed it's made me super fucking lazy with shooting yeah. because um, I just. Everything's on auto, auto. Oh no, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't leave mine on auto. Like I think, I think the only thing I do, like I'll set, I, I treat it, I, I do treat my Fuji like a film camera. So I'll set my ISO. I'll be like, I'll set it specifically, um, and lock it. I also like, I also love the, the, the locks on it. <laughs> Dude, the, the locks on it. Okay, so what Zane's talking about, this is like the coolest thing. Is there's these little buttons on top here, and you can't turn the knob right now, but if you just tap it. Now you now you can turn it and it just pops up a little bit and it gives me that same satisfaction that IKEA drawers with the little yeah they're very the yeah it's coat. actually very similar <laughs> it it has that same satisfaction to it um, but dude like the auto auto has really surprised me honestly because like I leave this eighty five or this this fifty six uh, one two which is an eighty five mil equivalent I leave it wide open at one two all the time. Yeah, and just have the auto on, and the only thing that I have to adjust every now and then, if I'm not happy with it, is just the exposure, bump it up or bump it down, which it's so nice just having that exposure compensation right there. Yep. And um, I've been in a bit of a creative funk since I moved to Vancouver because I haven't really been able to find like a film lab and stuff I've been happy with here, so I haven't been shooting as much film because it's just I still mail all my stuff back to Toronto, and this is like given me a bit of like creative mojo back because like it's just easy like it's yeah. like i grab it um walk out with it do some shooting like i have a nikon d610 which i like it's a great digital camera um but it's an awkward size because mm -hmm. it's, it's not like a full chunk like the f5 which I've learned to just live with because I absolutely love that and like I, I I've been tempted to get an F five. Dude. Or an F six or something buy, like that. I want to. Buy an F five. Get it. You won't regret it. Um like the F five for years has been my daily driver. Like the F five with a fifty one point four is like yeah. you know, if I'm shooting film yeah, well, I, I shoot with a fifty one point four on my on my M six. 
Nice. But I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, I'm a. I'm a heathen. I, I like the Leica bodies. I. I had a. I had a 50 millimeter Cinemacron and I sold it because I was like, eh. Like I, I didn't. I didn't really get like all the hype. So I got. I've got a, a Canon lens on my like M6. So that's <laughs> what I mainly shoot. It's either like a Voigtlander lens or a Canon lens on my Leica. Why not? But, like, I mean, yeah, exactly. Like, I, I prefer I prefer vintage lenses, and I had like a, a newer Summicron, and like it 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 was like really sharp. But it's like I don't I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't well, give a shit about like, that, the, that much. I do understand. So I never really fully understood the Leica hype until a friend of mine loaned me his M3, and now I want a Leica. And yeah. I've never, I've never wanted a Leica before, really. But like, um, there's just something about the way they feel, the build quality. Oh, of, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Like, yeah, I, I bought one because I was like, you know, I'll use it. Like, it, it, like this is because this was like whenever I was first fixing cameras and like I had some money, and I was like, you know what, I'll just get one. And if I, if I don't like it, I could always just sell it because it. It's not like it'll go down in value, which is yeah. kind of the, the funny thing. So, like, I was like, you know, it, I might as well just try it. And then, like, I, I really, I really liked how it felt. <laughs> You've got the M6 now? Yeah, I got, I got an M6. Yeah, I've been kind of, like, on the fence of which one I want to get myself. Yeah. Um, and... I don't know. I've been like debating like an M2 or an M3 because I really dig the um, the older ones. Um, yeah, but like an M4P or the M6, um, you know, those are pretty cool too. Yeah, I I the the main reasons why I chose the M6 specifically, and I didn't I didn't go with the TTL version. Like I didn't care that much about the the bigger dial. Like that, that doesn't really affect me. Like I got bigger hands, so like messing with the shutter speed dial like really doesn't matter to me like I, I i got access to it no matter what yeah um but what i really liked what i mainly liked about it was like the newer style of like the re rewind knob like i didn't like the older style with like little... oh, with the with the pop-up yeah I, I didn't like that as much um uh i, I kind of wanted a meter so i was like okay i gotta i'm like narrowing myself down in, in the first place to like one of the metered ones um but yeah, I mean, I I also just I I, I love the the classic stuff because I was also kind of looking at an M5, but then I was like, oh man, um, like okay, those are really ugly. So <laughs> I know John John was on here a little bit ago. He loves the M5s, and I know there's lots of people out there that love the M5s. Mm -hmm. Um, they're they're cool, but like I just I I've never I've never found myself drawn to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, well, the other the other problem that I was I was thinking of is like if I ever needed to get get it like CLA'd or repaired or anything like that, like I wouldn't do that personally. Like I, I've done my Hasselblad lenses, but like I don't think I would crack this thing open personally. Yeah. At least not right now. Um, and from everything that I heard, like the M5 is like a pain to get repaired. Like there's only like a couple of people that do those. Um, and then, like, from what I I mean, it could be wrong, but from what I was hearing, like it's it's almost impossible to get like the m6 ttl meters like repaired if they go bad yeah i've, I've heard that too so i was like okay you know i don't i i don't really want to spend like 400 dollars on like a bigger you know shutter speed dial or through the lens <laughs> flash metering like i don't i don't, I, I don't think i'd be using my leica as a studio camera and if i was going to use a studio camera i've got my hasselblad like i just throw it on a tripod like <laughs> So the only complaint I have about the Leica so far is the placement of the lens release button. Because my finger, when I'm holding it, tends to naturally like to rest on it. Oh. And okay. there was one time where... Yeah, mine does it, that too. I've never really noticed. Yeah, there's one time... Well, I only noticed it because I just about fucking had the Summicron eat shit on the pavement. Oh, no. Because I was taking a photo... And didn't realize that my finger was depressing the button. And when I went to focus the rangefinder, um, I took the lens like right off, and it went flying off of the camera, 
and luckily it like went flying into like you know my um my uh, elbow pit oh and i caught it from falling on the ground Jeez. otherwise i would have owed my friend a sumacron yeah which wouldn't have been too much fun that's my only like uh gripe with with the cameras so far is that and then it's also just a little like i wish it was a little tiny bit thicker just because of like my my pinky is uh the the m6 is i think i think the m6 is is thicker because it's got like all the mm -hmm. it's got a it's got like all the metering crap in it whatever yeah i, found I, was, I think it's taller problem. or something i don't know i, don't I, know. I, I think it's a different. problem when i used an m9 um, I took one out on a Leica test drive and I ended up really hating the M9 because after shooting with it for a few hours, it's a lot heavier than these are, I guess, because of like the battery and like all the ele extra electronics and stuff. Yeah. But it actually dented my pinky from really holding it. And like I had this like little like sore dent in my pinky from the M9 and I was just like, it's, it, it didn't really, um, impressed me that much but the m10 they did a really good job on um when armand had his m10 he let me play around with it a few times and like i was like okay they really improved this over the yeah years a lot but yeah. that said um i would probably still buy a fuji digital over a like <laughs> yeah no i don't i don't see myself ever getting a, a like a digital camera like i mean that's like it's like dropping 10 grand there's something ridiculous. Like it's, when it's even way too much. used. It's still a lot. People still want a shit ton of money for the used digital. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Like I'm. Yeah, that's not. That's not for me. Like yeah. Like honestly, like my my Fuji camera like is perfectly fine for me. Like throwing on like 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 manual glass and then you know turning on the focus peaking like it's like perfect. The TTL is taller, slightly thicker. All others are pretty much the same, except M5. Yeah, the M5 is, is, and I also don't like the sideways lugs on the M5. That just that 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 is real silly. Yeah. The sideways lugs drives me crazy. Like my my GW. Doesn't Andy I, have one? I I think Andy. I either he still has one or he had one because yeah. got the. Didn't he get an MP? I don't remember. I think he treated himself to an MP. Damn. like last year which i was like okay i mean that's that's, that's, that's baller money <laughs> those are those are hella nice like yeah um when like the other thing that i i really find impressive with with this is just like the fact it's so old and it still works so well yeah i i find myself biased to to mechanical cameras like that that was also a reason why like I knocked the M seven off my list was like I don't I like I don't wanna have like electronic cameras that could just end up failing and I can't like do, you know, you can't do anything with it. Like it, it, I, I'm sure like if there was like never a, a like a repair person in the world ever starting now or something like that, if like I got brave enough I could probably like CLA this one maybe at this point. <laughs> but like you know, if, if, if something like dies electronically, if it's like a, like a, you know, a custom IC or something that just shits itself, like I couldn't do anything about it. That's fair. And, and the mechanical thing is an interesting thing too. So it's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about this cause you're, you're really into the camera stuff and everything. And I've noticed that this has been a, a commonality with a lot of, of camera people is that they also happen to really be into, um, watches so is that like an, another no so i'm actually i'm actually not into watches i don't i don't really wow. have any watches the only watch i really have and wear is uh the good old uh ted cook apple watch so ted cook apple oh or the, the tim or apple tim watch. cook tim apple i don't know yeah the tim ted, ted cook ted 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 wozniak i don't know ted <laughs> i'm not i'm not gonna try to remember quintillionaire names i don't care about it enough i do also have an apple watch but i really only use it for sleep tracking now oh okay because i i used to be into watches and then i stopped giving a shit about them and then a friend of mine 
rebooted my interest in in watches again so um the apple watch has just become i put it on before bedtime so i can keep track of how my sleep goes and then um i wear like other watches during the day and i I do kind of like the mechanical ones because it's nice to like not be reliant on batteries and stuff like that yeah you know the electronic ones are kind of cool i i i do i do have a watch that requires like the 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 turning stand thing to to keep it to keep it powered with the spring or whatever i don't know enough about watches where that so it's it's an automatic watch it'd be something like yeah yeah um, they're cool i just i i don't know i've not i've not really gotten too into into watches for some reason i've just been purely like i i, I only like really collect right now like cameras for the most part um i don't know why i don't really i don't really have any reason like i just, I just i've just been picking up and trying to like fix different cameras like i i finally took the plunge in like fixing like my hasselblad lenses because i had one that had like a really weird issue it was my 80 where it would um i couldn't uh i could i couldn't get it to to fire the shutter properly only on f22 so weird so like i would i if i if i try to fire the shutter at f22 um Oh, I guess I'll I'll answer that in a second. I'll do that. Uh, but I, if I try to fire an F twenty two, what would end up what 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 would end up happening um, is uh, it would it would get stuck pretty much. So mm-hmm. it would close down. It, like the aperture would obviously be at, like close down to F twenty two. That'd be fine. Um, but it wouldn't actually fire the shutter of my um, like it wouldn't open the shutter and then close it. Um, until the auxiliary uh, curtain in the back closed. So basically the, the exposure would happen after the rear curtain was closed. There would be no exposure, Oh yeah, which is so weird. And then I was like, okay, well, I wonder what would happen if I like flip the mirror up and then do the, and then try to fire it. And it would work perfectly fine if I flip the mirror up, Weird, which is so weird. Um, so I took it apart and I guess somebody had definitely, like, I think one of the things that gets me a lot when it comes to repairing things is I started to be able to tell when somebody's been in a camera, like there's some pretty clear signs that something has gone wrong. Like I get that a lot with my SX-70 repairs, but that Hasselblad lens, there was so much grease in that lens. Like somebody had gone in there and was like, Oh, this isn't, you know, it's stuck or something. And they just like slapped like a ton of grease in there. So I spent time just like cleaning. I put, I popped like the uh, the slow the slow uh, speeding like uh, engagement in my ultrasonic cleaner, and I just cleaned everything out. And then I put it back together, and everything was fine, and it worked perfectly fine. It still works perfectly fine. <laughs> so I had to take, took I had to take apart the leaf shutter for it. It was just like ridiculous. So someone took the lube part of CLA a little too liberally. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of a lot of those leaf shutters are, are meant to like run with minimal lubricant. Like a lot of them are pretty much meant to to run dry. Like the Prontors are supposed to run dry. The um, uh, Compures, I think that's what's in the, the Hasselblad lenses, um, are also meant to run pretty much dry. Um, because what ends, what's up, what ends up happening is that they'll get like dust in them and dirt, and it'll basically like gum it up. Mm. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, what what. Uh, Tara was talking about. I was, just we were, we were, I was supposed to answer like what projects I was working on, like an hour. We'll get we'll get back to projects, but like okay. it, uh, Chris was asking, more discussion about what sort of photography gets you out of the house. Yeah. Um, so for recently, like I mean, for the past like I don't know, like two and a half years, like I haven't really been shooting much, to be honest. I like I I've also been in kind of like a slump. Like I've I've never really been like much, in my opinion at least, like much of like a photographer. Like I kind of like did, I've done it mostly for fun. Um. But I guess more recently, like I've I've kind of had like more of a drive. Like I think I think half of it was like kind of getting over myself, really. Hmm. Um, and like, in in the sense of like, um, being too nervous about how my work would get perceived or how I would get perceived more like. Um, 
because like especially like for example like i guess it would go down to like um like i i, I could be kind of like shy around a lot of people so like past Policons, like up until recently, like I haven't like talked to anybody. Like I'd just be kind of like in the corner, like just doing nothing. Yeah. Um, because like I, I like I don't know, like I, I would feel like I'm not like as much of like an artist as other people. Like it would be like I would kind of be blocking myself from like a lot of it. Um, but right before the pandemic happened, like I was starting to work on a project actually. <laughs> and then all of a sudden everything shut down and I was like, okay, well that's, that's fantastic. What was but the I, I, Um, so it's, it's something that like I, I was like thinking about for like a while. So like specifically, um, it's, I, I want to take like pictures of things that are on a, a specific highway in Texas. Okay um so there's a highway that actually runs between um denton and all the way like it, it keeps going but like it, it goes all the way to lubbock as, at, like, at least and like i spent a lot of my childhood in lubbock um i always ended up in lubbock as a kid really yeah i'll finish your story and i'll tell you okay lubbock. okay um yeah so like i i, I want to take pictures of uh like all the small like stoplight towns and like whatever else is actually on um on 380 specifically because that's like the that's the route that I would take whenever like my family would be driving to Lubbock um because I I had both sets of my great grandparents there um like all like all of my family is pretty much from Lubbock so it was it was basically like every couple of months I would basically kind of make like a pilgrimage back to Lubbock off 380 and I would always be like looking at all of the all of like the small towns that are around there, and they're all kind of like they're they're all kind of dying because 380 is not really like a commonly taken route to get to Lubbock. Usually, hmm. um, it's usually like 114 down to Lubbock, um, and like whatever that turns into, I can't really remember. Um, but I, I, it's like it, it like I, I've already really been really interested in like the actual, um, I guess, landscape and. Um, I guess just the small towns in general that are kind of just like dying in that area. Um, but I mean, it's 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 really interesting because it's like I, over time I've already seen like all of those like change a lot from whenever I was younger to like now. Um, and I guess now it's like a, like an even deeper personal connection because uh, three eighty like I whenever I would take three eighty like it would it would I, I we would go up to it as opposed to like it running straight through. Denton like it literally it's what university drive is like it's like it goes all the way through there so I I, I don't know it's just like it's I guess it's like a, a personal connection to like who I am and it's like sappy but it's like it's a personal connection between who I am now and like where I would spend my childhood and, I don't and all think, the interconnecting bits I don't think that's sappy though I, I I think stories like that are really important um to share not only for you like it, it's important to like put something out like that you know for yourself where you're at this age and you're thinking about the, those kinds of things where it's like if you do put that together into a project um where you have like a, a set of photos or you turn it into a book or something um you know that's something that you wickedly appreciate later on down the road even if it's something you just you made like one copy of it just for yourself or like yeah. copies for friends and family like you know that's something where it's like all of this stuff is fairly fresh in your mind right now and um you know speaking a little bit from experience age and things that happen as you get older really start to affect how you remember those those kinds of things and uh so it's like you know having something that you put together when you're a bit sharper with this stuff that you could look back on later and maybe have it jog and reinvigorate memories that may not be as as sharp as they were um when you made that project um, would be a really valuable thing to have but then like outside of that like if it was something that you broadly shared um you know, you could have no idea how that could connect with other people as well, too. 
that yeah. may have similar feelings, similar experiences. And, you know, it could be something that really resonates with, with a lot of people. So I wouldn't call it a sappy thing. Like it's, I, it's a genuine article and we need more stuff like that um, in this time of like social media and squid game and COVID. <laughs> Yeah. So I dude, I I think you should you should just kick that into high gear and do something with it. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I, I need to make I need to make some time specifically to do that. Um because I I have been like even even like whatever I have like working on it actively because I, I have some pictures for it, but I don't I don't really know if like um I really like those yet because I've 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 been kinda like still I guess developing the direction that I want to take that in specifically, um, like what what style I want to do it in. Like I, I kind of I've kind of been like more leaning into maybe shooting it all black and white on like exclusively like orthochromatic film or something like that, just to get that mood even further. And maybe in the winter, just to, like because one, it would be, it's hot as fuck. <laughs> like I don't really want to yeah. deal with that. Um, but but also like the the, the lighting, I think at least personally, like from what like I'm, I'm imagining might be a little bit uh, more pleasing for what I'm wanting to do. Because I don't, I don't want it to be like necessarily like, uh, like, like poverty porn, <laughs> I guess is a good way to put it. Like I, because like, I'll, like I, I've been, I've been like researching specifically like the towns that are on the route because a lot of them are like, you know, they're, they're, they're just, there, there's nothing for anybody there really anymore um and i was i was wanting to like figure out like the history behind it, like why was that town initially built and like see if i could locate like where um important centers were in those towns um you know i i would almost maybe like this might be like a bit of like a tommy wiseau direct <laughs> with it yeah, if yeah if you know the room yeah uh, but it's um i i get the idea of shooting orthochromatic it it's such a such an interesting film um so i, I could that could like look really cool in the desert i also really like like triax is really cool for desert yeah too. um i haven't had a chance to shoot any double x in the desert, but I imagine double X would probably look really fucking cool in the desert too. Probably, yeah. Um, but I would like if, if you're out there and you're doing some deliberate road trips to just sort of go and, and do some shooting, maybe do two cameras and like do one that's in black and white and do one that's in color. So when you're doing layout later and you're trying to get a feel for things, mm -hmm. uh, it might be really cool to do a mixture of color and black and white with something like that because yeah I, I was i was mainly planning on shooting it with with my house of blood i've got a couple of backs for that so like it's oh that's perfect then so yeah you, like I can just, you know take the same shot and see what it what i would actually prefer and yeah no i, I mean i've been i've been thinking of all the the, the layers that i want to go with it and well because you know these, these are just ideas that i've been like mulling in my mind like i don't, I don't really have anything set in stone quite yet for no, a lot absolutely. of absolutely um you know it's you just your your comment there of of wanting to avoid poverty porn, um, maybe having some stuff in color broken up with the black and white could kind of like shake up the mood a little bit. Where it's like yeah. you can still have it like with with like a, a consistent mood, but like um, black and white has a very very distinctive like strong mood to it uh, sometimes. Um, and with a subject matter like that, being able to break it up and have some color in, um, you could use that as a tool in some of these places to show that, like, even though this place may look like sort of uh, downtrodden and, you know, maybe even like a little bit desolate and really sort of like out of luck, um, the color could show that it still has some vibrancy and some light, yeah. uh, which, which could be kind of cool to do a bit of a mix like that like kind of like if if um when jason did a plain view if he did a mixture of color and black and white like that would have been 
kind of a cool thing to see like you know some of those scenes in in um the the roads in texas there in black and white would have been really cool um but like the color also was just like really really cool to see yeah no that i mean that makes sense to me yeah, and then you, you never know. Maybe you, you do all that shooting and you're like, nah, I just want it to be black and white. But like, yeah. <laughs> at, at least you have those images there because it would suck if you're like looking through and yeah. you could do the layout and you're like, man, like, I wonder what this scene would have looked like in color. Yeah. Um, and then it just saves you from having to go back. And because like, that's the one thing that sucks too is like, I don't know if you've come across this, but I definitely have where there's times I've shot something I didn't quite get the shot that I wanted out of it. And I'm like, I'll just go back and take another picture yeah. sometime. And then you go back and it's gone. Yeah. And you're just like, well, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I always carry at least two cameras. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I, that's a cool project I, idea. Yeah. No, I mean, I've been, I've been wanting to do that for a while. I just have to, I have to carve out time again to do it. Um, you know, I, I just got to, I got to set aside, like, the, the lucky thing, I mean, I, I live at the beginning point of where I would want to start it. Uh, it's just a matter of, like, uh, yeah, obviously, yeah, setting aside the time for it. Um, How far of the drive? To, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, the, the, the whole drive is, like, about five and a half hours just to get to Lubbock. Oh, that's not bad. It's not bad, no. So, uh, I mean, I, I would, I'd break it up into pieces anyway, so it's not like, it's not like I would it's kind of one of those, it's kind of one of those those projects that I would definitely be. Um, I w it would have to be. It would have. To, it, it's not going to be like a weekend thing. Like I'm not going to do it all in one go. Like I'm going to have to, you know. Which is why I was like wanting to research each individual place that I was going to go. Um, I guess kind of online, scout out like a general story of that place. Not necessarily the story that I'm telling, or just like the story of like what happened there. That way, I know like what would be an interesting, um, I guess, shot to do or sh shots to do there. And then, you know, hit a couple of places and then I could, you know, either go home depending on the, the distance that I'm going or, or stay somewhere and then hit the next couple. And Yeah, just do, do like the Jason Lee kind of adventure and get yourself a sketchy motel and... Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I used to I used to do that with well there there was there was one trip that I had with some friends that was kind of like that where we, we would just stay at some sketchy motels. That was I mean, a fun if you've never stayed at a motel where you put on all the clothes that you've brought with you <laughs> and all the stuff yeah. left on top of the sheets, I don't think you're really living yet. Yeah, no, you you yeah you you haven't experienced the the whole gamut of life yet. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you haven't, if you haven't had a shitty living situation, if you, if you haven't done, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things you got to do those before you can say that you've been alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when, when I was a kid, my mom was a nurse when, when I was growing up and uh, we were living in Northern BC and um, these recruiters reached out to her asking if she wanted to work for a hospital in Lubbock, Texas. And um, they paid for us to, um, yeah, Chris has some talking about Wawa, Ontario. There's some really shitty motels that Chris and I have shared in uh, Wawa, Ontario, and that I've <laughs> also stayed in with other friends. And um, yeah, it is such a shithole. I actually, I do, I'm playing with a pen, I'm fidgeting with it, but like this pen is from the Wawa. <laughs> in Wawa, Ontario, with a nice big Canadian flag there. So that's, yep. That's how you know that's that's the Wawa, Ontario, Canada, and not the that's... Wawa, Ontario. Well, and, and not the Wawa where you go and, like, you know, try and get some cigarettes and have, like, you know, someone <laughs> want to pick a fight with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not that kind of Wawa. Um, but yeah, we they invited us out to Edmonton, and they, like, you know, schmoozed my family and everything, and my mom just about um, had us move to Texas. Um, Your but... life has been so much worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mean, it could have been interesting. Like, 
Um, I probably still would have loved Tex Mex as much as I do your, now. Your your fam okay, so your your family then would have probably known my family. Yeah, who knows? But what ended up well, uh, killing it? Uh, so my my granddad. So there's there's a Ford dealership in Lubbock, Texas, and my granddad owns that Ford dealership. Well, he did oh, wow. until he died. <laughs> uh, yeah. So like, there's like a big sign. Yeah, side of the road that says Pollard friendly Ford. Oh, that's cool. You you know you're gonna have to get that photo in your book. Oh no, yeah, that's that. I mean, there, there's so yeah, there's a couple of locations in, in Lubbock. There's that there's that one, like that one's clear, and then uh, both of my my great grandparents' houses. So like one of them, because my my family's kind of weird. Um, my I mean it, it's a it's a pretty normal story, but like the way that it happened is kind of weird because so like a lot of my family had kids late like my extended mm -hmm. family had kids late because I, I have, i'm really close to, like all my extended family weirdly enough like all 20 of us will go to places together we'll get dinner together like it's it's insane um but my my aunt my great aunts and uncles technically great aunts and uncles had kids at like 35 oh wow and my granddad and my my nana had kids at 17 <laughs> so i i had both sets of my great grandparents growing up up until i was about well so one set up until i was like 13 14 so their house uh is currently is owned by somebody else now um which would be kind of weird. I, I haven't driven by there. Like that, that would make me really sad because I spent like a lot of my childhood in that house specifically. Like it's one of those places where like, I, I can, me like I memorized like how that house looks just by how much time I spent there as a kid. Um, so I would definitely get one of that house because it, it would be, it'd be interesting to see how it looks now. I just haven't, I haven't looked in like a long time. Um, well, I mean, if if you do go by it, knock on the door and like see if anyone's home. I've done that with my the house I grew up in um, when I was a kid in Calgary, and uh, it was kind of fascinating, like chatting with with the person. Um, I didn't knock on the door because it was COVID times. Um, yeah, but I was taking pictures of it, and she like asked me some questions about it. And she's like, "Oh, I actually live here." Because she's like walking up the street, and she's like, "If oh. it were COVID, I totally invite you in the house to like check out what it's like." But um, you know, depending on when you go out there, like you know, you never know. They might be like cool with it, just being like, "Oh yeah, fuck, come check it out," and you can like, you know, yeah, some interest. Yeah, I might, I might get that a shot. But uh, my my other my other great grandmother, uh, she's still around. <laughs> Which is again like I'm 25, so it's kind of like an odd thing. Um, but yeah, so so that that house obviously I know is is still there. So that's another one. Um, there's a couple of parks around there that I'll definitely be taking pictures of too, just because I, I used to run around there. Um, it, it, I mean, I, again, like I'm not, I'm, I'm like I'm re I'm real young, so it's it's kind of weird to like reminisce like that, but like. You know, that, that was like a big chunk of my life. Yeah, I, I can't say I'm really young anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> what ended up um, dissuading my mother from having us move to uh, Lubbock was um, when they asked her uh, or when they told her that she was only allowed to have two firearms on her at any given time. <laughs> and my mother was like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you're allowed to have one concealed and one open weapon. If you have any more than that, you have to leave them with security, and then you can get them on your way home. And she's like, but no, what do you mean weapon? And they're like, well, we really recommend that you have a weapon on you because you're going to be working in emergency, and you just never know what the patients are going to have on them when they come on in. So it we recommend our employees have some protection. And she's like, I'm supposed to be saving lives, not taking lives. And she's like, well, you just never know when you, when you might need to like pop a cap in someone's ass. I mean, you, you never know. Yeah. And that's why we didn't move to Lubbock.
that's that's <laughs> actually that's actually really funny yeah yeah i thought it was funny but it was wild like they were desperate for nurses back then this was like the early 90s yeah um and it was like uh, they sweetened the pot like crazy like they were gonna buy our house that we had in canada and just deal with it themselves buy us a house in texas um that's crazy like you know everything was paid for so um yeah but i mean if that happened i probably would have never ended up going the path that i did and like you know never doing the photography yeah you you would have you would have done the 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 greatest uh lubbock pastime and that's that's the only thing that you could do and that is drink that's well, it. there's nothing over there like i don't i don't know what people do <laughs> well okay but the weirdest the weirdest thing is the weirdest thing is one of the one of the biggest memories i have of going with my with my papa uh who's my great granddad like we would always so lubbock itself is dry or was dry until like 2012 which means like, because you know we're, we're or what? like legally like they had laws against it yeah <laughs> so so within within city limits um you could not buy liquor um and you know you would have you what you would have to do is you would have to go uh out of the city limits to this this uh place called the strip so what we would do is my is I would go with my papa if I was staying with him, and we would go he would go get his liquor, because you know sometimes you you just have to get like scotch or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then also there was a uh, a a stall where you could get chicken gizzards, uh, fried chicken gizzards. Okay, I can't. This is like the most. This is the most Texan thing that I can say. Like I don't, I don't know what else. I was going with my great granddad to go, go get liquor and chicken gizzards down at the Lubbock Strip. Like, like just every time, every time I would visit, and you know, I I remember exactly like that. The, the strip, I don't, I don't think really exists anymore because Lubbock is no longer dry. Um, Denton was also dry up until I think 2016, or something really? like that. Yeah, no, Denton, Denton was dry. Weirdly enough, there's like there's a so, lot of there's a there's a lot of places in Denton that are dry. I mean, not in Denton, Texas. If that was the case, though, that crazy beer store behind uh, Armand's shop, what the hell did they do before? Oh, they no, that that's crazy? different. That's different. Beer, beer, and wine are different. So, oh, um, okay. so when it comes explaining anything that that is about texas law is uh like like giving yourself a lobotomy like it's just like you're just like twisting the screw in further and further until you're I going stupider and stupider watch the news recently with all of like you know the abortion stuff and all that can probably yeah get it yeah no it's like yeah this this place is uh it is the yeah it, it, it's 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 something but um yeah, no. Up until like 2016, it was it was dry here. Um, the liquor laws here, specifically, um, you can only buy liquor Monday through Saturday um, Monday. from like 11 a.m. until 9 p.m. Um, but beer and wine you can buy from Monday through Sunday like 6 a.m. until midnight, but on the weekends, it's 1 a.m. <laughs> so it, it's weird. I don't know. I don't know what it, I don't know what it does. All it, all it does is like it increases uh, uh, drunk driving <laughs> because, because if you can't get your, if you can't get your, li your, your liquor, you're just going out to the bar and then you're driving home. So, you know, That's it's fantastic. Cool. It's great. Uh, everybody here is really smart and all of our politicians are really smart and they know what's best for all of us. And I love our governor, Craig Abbott. He's my favorite. He, they're all just stable geniuses, <laughs> right? What? They're all just stable geniuses, right? Oh yeah. No, they're, they're, they're the, they're the biggest brains in this, in this country. And I am so glad that uh, my day-to-day -day life is dictated by uh, these bozos. It makes me feel good. Well, so did you see the news today on, and this is sort of like connected to Texas a little bit, but the governor of Idaho is in Texas right now doing some stuff there. 
and his lieutenant governor decided that since he was no longer in the state, that she was now the acting governor and decided to like enact all these things being like, no, I was acting governor. And he's like, no, I'm still. That I'm rules. Still... That's, that should be how everything's done. <laughs> if, if, you can, if you can, if you can kick, if you can kick your boss over the border, you should be able to do whatever you want. Like if you can hog tie him and just like toss him over the state border, free for all. Why not? That's apparently what she thought. So she was that's, like, "That's about to... I just, that's about it. That's that's probably like a better system than like what we have right now. So like, why not just have it? Just have it be everybody's trying to get everybody to leave the state. Why not? It'd be funny. That would be, that would be kind of funny. I mean, America is something else. Texas surprised me though. Like the first time I went to Texas I was honestly wicked nervous about it because I'm not <laughs> and so I was just like you know I yeah. in, in my mind like you know for Texas I just pictured a bunch of like drunk racist rednecks <laughs> and Armand was like no it's safe and I'm like well I mean you're not really white either so you're still kicking so you know you can't be all that bad yeah and then I fell in love with Denton, which feels really weird to say that out loud. Uh, yeah, I mean it, it's it's a pocket. So like, I mean, going off going off of you know politics and uh, how Texas politics work and Denton, uh, they recently uh, they 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 proposed a new redrawing of districts. Um, in the state of Texas, because I think we got another house seat or something like that. I can't remember. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I don't remember exactly the details as to what, what triggered them being able to, to redraw it. Um, so the city of Denton, which is in uh, Northeast Texas, right? It's North Texas, Northeast central Texas. Okay. There is a, uh, there is a city in the Panhandle uh, named Amarillo, which is, you know, obviously the incorrect pronunciation, but that's what everybody calls it. It's Amarillo, so whatever. Um, and that is currently in the exact same district as Denton, a city that is six and a half hours away from Denton, <laughs> separated by all of that rural area. And the entire panhandle included is in the same district as Denton, which is a city that is a suburb or, you know, exurb or whatever you want to refer to it as of the DFW Metroplex. <laughs> Wait, so it's not, so Denton's not part of the Dallas municipalities then? No. It's part of this other one. Yeah, well, uh, as far as far as as far as uh, uh, our our representation in uh, the federal government goes, so that's a little ridiculous. It it is. I mean, it uh, the the entirety of the American system was built upon, uh, you know, ensuring class interests. So. It, it being able to be gerrymandered in that just, way is you kind just, of a part of it. You could just call it racist. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's entirely. I mean, that's what it was. That's what it was. I mean, the it, them being able to do this is, is is a feature of the system. Like it's it's not it's not a bug. It's a feature. Like that's entirely yeah. what it is. They're ju they're just. It, it was built this way. It was never changed. So that's how it's being used. So why why change it when it's such a white system? I mean, right system. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, our politics in Canada are like kind of ridiculous too. Like, yeah, politics in general, just the best. Um, yeah, but that that's weird. So it's northeast Texas because I always thought for some reason in my mind it's north central, but it's like I, I I mean if you look at Texas as a whole, it's like to the east. So like I, it's kind of weird because because of how our cities are placed, people kind of, uh, like, they don't, they don't look at it, like, geographically. They look at it, like, kind of weighted by, like, where the metroplexes are. So, like, far in the west, you've got, like, El Paso. Uh, yeah. To the north, you've got Lubbock and Amarillo. 
south you've got like uh you got like san antonio then houston central you got austin um then north you got dallas and you know the rest of the cities that are up there um so people kind of like weight it as like austin being purely the center of it Hmm. um which is even though it's like kind of like to the east a little bit like it's weighted to the east so like you have to be like far east to be considered east texas but like if you're looking at things geographically like you're kind of we're kind of northeast well it's just funny so like before i ever ended up in denton one of my favorite albums that i like was um the mountain goats all yeah texas yeah has a, a song on it the best ever den metal death metal band out of denton yeah and so I always thought because of that album, I, I always pictured Den being in West Texas because of that album. Um, yeah. But it was also a trip to the first time I went there for Policon, mm-hmm. going to to Dallas and stuff. Uh, when we went to Deep Ellum, um, because I totally spaced out that you know that's where Gas Monkey Garage was like filmed and stuff. And so like yeah, I that sometimes on TV and it was like oh shit, I know some of these places, but yeah on a, a different tip on the YouTube thing, there's this like ridiculous like YouTube channel that shows like surveillance videos of people's cars getting towed from their like back lot, which is like a data center in deep Ellum. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I sometimes when I'm bored, I'll put those in the background because I love his commentary that he puts in. And then when I went there, I was like, holy shit, I think this is like where, that uh tow truck youtube thing is from (laughs) yeah there there's there's a there's a couple of things that are that are you know texas basically wouldn't exactly expect to be um i mean texas like you know i i i don't want to live here the rest of my life but uh you know it's not all bad (laughs) so i i guess once you live in a place long enough though um you start becoming more disillusioned with it um i feel a lot of the time like i well either you either you become like kind of like like jaded about it or you like yeah you you like really (laughs) really love it (laughs) i don't really know if there's like an in-between for a lot of that if you spend a lot of time in one place it's a good idea to to get around because like you've basically lived in texas your your whole life eh uh, I was born in Austin, okay. so it's it's kind of weird. Um, so I, I guess I could have gone into that. I was born in Austin, um, and I had to move around a lot when I was young because my dad got really sick. He used to work on like electrical transformers. Okay. Um, and like his partner, I guess, like really fucked up, and he got electrocuted. So he had to get brain surgery. So like for the first four years of my life. Mm. Uh, my dad wasn't really present because he couldn't be like, he was like, he was like bedridden the entire time. Just like, just with extreme nausea because it like cooked his brain. Um, so after that, we ended up moving, I moved to big bear, California, weirdly enough. So I used to live in, I used to live in the mountains in California, in the Sierra Nevada range. Um, and then I moved to Eugene, Oregon. Once my dad got better and he finally got a he got a job working actually like at Sirius XM like before they like became a bigger thing um and then after that we moved again um to Tacoma Washington so I spent probably the biggest amount of time from like the ages of like seven to ten or eleven maybe um like in in Tacoma so um, after that I then moved back down here to Texas and I've been here ever since but yeah so I guess yeah most of my life I've been in Texas but there was there was a good chunk where I was like moving around and I remember all of that and I was uh you know living in different places so I've I've experienced different places I've been around to a lot of different areas but so you've um, got a taste of what's out there yeah yeah and then I got put back down here uh, where like, I, I like taking pictures like of landscapes a lot. And the, the issue is that like Texas is kind of like in a lot, in certain places, in certain places that are accessible to me in the immediate vicinity of me, 
are kind of one note. <laughs> um, so but you got the light there, and the light down there is just yeah, oh, like so good. Yeah. And then like Norman Roscoe, that upstairs. I I wish I had access to that. That would be fun. Dude, just I like go, go pop by there and, and bug him sometime and just be like, what's a guy got to do to be able to go take some pictures up there? I guess, yeah. I, I could give it a shot. I, I just don't, I don't, I've been trying to more. Like I had a lot of, I, I, I don't really, I don't really take that many portraits. Mm. Um, I've been trying to more. I, I had like a lot of pictures of people at Pol- look on this year. Um, because once, 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 you know. <clears throat> yeah, I, your, your portraits this year. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really like I spent a lot of time, uh, like working on on the the flash portion of Open SX seventy, um, like the entire week yeah, before. I, can't I, I, I had I hadn't really uh, I hadn't really messed with it too much. Like I did a little bit of it, and it was kind of like a little bit more fiddly then. Um, but the week before Policon, like I just spent the entire time. I I cranked through like eight packs of film, probably, um, just like testing the the crap out of the flash well specifically like the 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 splash sync sec- section of the the code and actually no i did also mess with the flash bar parts it was just like how flash was captured entirely so I, I i messed with that for like an entire week and then i finally got it to the point that i i liked it and it worked out real well <laughs> so froggy says they're going to bed so <laughs> they're saying good night um, right, Becca. I think on on that note too, my phone's about to die, so I I should probably say good night here sooner okay. than do before it unceremoniously drops off. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to say, dude, thank you so much for spending some time with me, and um, I really really like nerding out on this one. Cause, yeah, um, we talk about gear sometimes, but it was cool to like you know really really talk about like the nerdy parts of it. Um, I especially liked when he busted out the the micrometer. <laughs> that that will probably be the first and only time I have a guest bust out a micrometer. <laughs> that, that's what I, that's what I, I I use my calipers to like whenever I'm prototyping uh, uh, parts for things. Like I, I don't I don't have one here, but recently I made a uh, uh, like a copy of the clip-in Holga filter, like the Holga mask. Yeah, I saw that the your story with the cactus thing. Dude, that was yeah. so cool. That turned out so well. It, it worked way too well. I was pretty stoked about it. But yeah, I, I use that to like just basically like get the dimensions of things and I throw it into like my, my CAD software. Um, and it was just sitting there. So I thought that'd be funny. That's very cool. But thank you for spending some time with me. I yeah, man. And everyone for tuning in and and hanging out with us uh, through through the episode. Um, next week, I'm going. It's going to be a late night next week uh, because the guest next week is going to be uh, Lucy Lumen, who is on the other side of the world in New Zealand, I believe. Uh, so, because of uh, her time zone, um, we're going to be starting at 11 p.m. my time. Um, but uh, it should be a fun episode. For anyone that can tune in, and if not, you can always catch it on the, uh, the recording later and on podcasting. So, looking forward to that. And Zane, thank you so much again. Oh shit! And just as I'm about to oh. out here, <laughs> Grainy Days goes up. <laughs> What's up, Jason? Hey, man. <laughs> um, you'll just have to catch this on the recording, Big Papa. But uh, I hope Baxter is doing well. And uh, you know, I love all you guys. I appreciate you all for just helping me keep this thing going you know I, i've got some really cool guests coming up for the rest of the year and then it's on to planning um next year's season so thank you everybody you guys stay safe yeah. out there and uh you know we'll see you next week yeah y'all have a good night take care zane